spite of my efforts, he seems to find his way into the conversation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'm going to um, get a, a roll call. We have Paula Cole, we have Jim, we have Tyler, we have Bill. We have Brenda, we have Burton. I don't see Toby. Okay, so we have a quorum, so I'll call the meeting to order. Um, first thing is the approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Um, I think you all received them. Um, can I get an, a, a motion to approve the minutes from the August 11th meeting? A motion to approve the uh, minutes of the last meeting. Okay. And a second? Second. Okay. Um, Janet or um, Cecilia, do you have any oral presentations, communications? I have one. Do you have any? No, I didn't receive any. Lisa, did you receive any? I have received no uh, no communication. Okay, I have one. We got to vote on the minutes. Oh, oh, I thought we did. Oh, first and second. Sorry, can I get a? I got a motion first and a second. Yeah. Um, all those in favor of approving the minutes for August 11th, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so I did actually. Kathy got a letter. Um, and I wanted to read it because it, it, it's something that we, we may or may not know about. It's an organization we may or may not know about. I wanted to read it and then we can discuss it later in the meeting. But this is from Ann Christensen and she is, her letter says, hello San Clemente City Council members, including us. Uh, my name is Ann Christensen. I am a current resident of San Clemente where I have lived since 1990. Since November 2010 I have worked at Aegis, how do you pronounce Aegis. that? Aegis of Dana Point and Capistrano Beach, assisted living and memory care as a marketing director serving families and their loved ones throughout South OC and beyond. We are located at 26922 Camina de Estrella, Dana Point, Capistrano Beach, just beyond the Sprouts Plaza on the west side of the freeway. I have worked with many families that have, lo have loved ones that live locally that require additional layers of support over the years and on both short-term stay opportunities and those that transition into a more permanent transition. Our short stay program is designed to help individuals that may be transitioning from a stay at a hospital or skilled nursing facility and are looking for the next step in assistance before returning home. We are staffed 24 seven and have nurses seven days a week. We have residents that are needing very limited assistance and others that require more assistance through our continuum of care, including physical, occupational therapy, home health visits, hospice, and more. Our short-term stay respite program is also available to relieve families that have loved ones being cared for by family. Our assisted living and memory care program offers an abundance of services and amenities for those that reside at Aegis 
of Dana Point, including but not limited to meals, personal laundry, housekeeping, transportation services, activities, and most important, loving care for the personal assistance required due to physical limitations or cognitive challenges. I have been presenting via Zoom opportunities to local organizations, rotary, estate planners, hospitalists, honor services so individuals, families can plan for the future or be prepared with information if an immediate need occurs and how we can support each other through these transitional times. Topics include what is assisted living? How much does it cost? Does my insurance cover these services? Can I do rehab recovery in assisted living? I would like to offer to you and any friends family here in San Clemente a future date to hold an informational webinar via Zoom with a Q&A so I may share resources and answer any questions each may have. I am happy to hand deliver or email materials to review that may be helpful when our discussions are taking place. I can set up an RSVP and each can contact me individually or simply join in on the session and request additional information after the scheduled session. I look forward to talking with you. Please feel free to call or email at your convenience with any questions you may have for this to be a consideration. If you know of someone that would like to a smaller, more intimate FaceTime or Zoom call, I'm happy to do this with only a few or one family person at a time. Thank you for your time. I'm here to help and look forward to being a resource for all of our friends in San Clemente. Thank you for all for everything you do for our city. Your dedication is very much appreciated. I'm Ann Christensen, Marketing Director. So, um, just wanted you all to, uh, to know about a, a new resource that we have. <coughs> it doesn't sound like it's all that new, but uh, I wanted to make everybody aware of this. And we'll be incorporating this into one of our next our agenda items later on in the meeting. Okay. So Paula? I guess, yes. Paula, I'm sorry, this is Lisa Acosta. Can, is it possible to email me that um, public comment? That way I can put it in our binder for the record. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. The next is um, 4A, Unfinished Business. And um, I don't know how many of you went to some of the meetings that City Council had about the work plan, our work plan. Um, I have it here. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how, what, what we're supposed to do. I know that we're taking one item out. And I think there's one I want to sort of add in, in, its, in its place, although I believe it was approved. So I think it's basically approved with one thing being removed and then some discussion. Because um, at the city council meeting, they did approve our, our work plan with one section removed. So the section they wanted to remove is the last one, which was to, which is entitled Restore Deleted Social Services Grants Budget Item for Fiscal Year 2021 Budget. And it was the 54000 that was approved by the HAC was omitted from the general fund due to COVID-19 issues. Um, I wanted them to restore it. They said that we should come back in mid-year with needs and they would reconsider the needs, maybe not the 54000 but the needs. And if anything pressing, really, really emergency came up between now and then just to let city council know. So that section was removed. Um, and then the, the work plan that's been approved is basically um, having forums, which it said mental health forum, but it was sort of expanded to include forums as necessary. Um, and they don't have to be as big as the, the one we had for the town hall. It can be whatever we feel that we need to congregate and educate the public on anything that we feel that they need to be educated on and get educated ourselves. Um, the humanitarian award at the high school, which I will talk about in the next section. The social services grants, which we always do. Meetings with a theme, which we've been doing for the past year. The coronavirus impact assessment, which we'll have in the next section of today's meeting. Homelessness work plan for the city, which the outline of which um, Bill and Tyler are very familiar with, and now they're running with it with their own work plan, which they'll discuss later in the meeting. And then appoint two committee meetings to the two committee members to the joint homeless subcommittee, which is complete because we have appointed Tyler and Bill to that. So we basically have a really, I think, a pretty good work plan for the year, um, and it pretty much fits with what we want to do. 
The only thing I would like to add, and it's going to involve assignments for all of you, <laughs> and people who were on the committee a couple of years ago remember, we have a resource directory that's out there on the internet, and it's got 18, 16 pages, and it still needs to be updated. So um, what I'm going to do, and I won't do it right now, but I'm, I've sent it out to all of you yesterday around 2 o'clock. Um, we'll like, I'd like to look through it, and the last time we did it, we assigned two pages to each person. I'm not exactly sure how, unless somebody has an idea now, how we want to assign, but we need to go and call all these numbers and check in, you know, in maps and Google at these addresses and go to their websites and see if they're still here. We also want to add all the new resources in town, of which I've already said, find your anchor, the I-5, CityNet, lots of, lots of them. Um, so does anybody have any idea about how to keep this up to date or what we should do for right now, how we should assign this? Who's the disperser of these resources? Like, where does this go and how do people find it? It's on the San Clemente Board under social services. When you do a search on it, it comes right up. I'm not sure which section it's in, but it's on the internet, on, on, our, on the, the portal, on the San Clemente portal. So you kind of have no to look for it, if that's what you yeah, want. Yeah, so it, it, it's called a resource guide. We probably, and that might be a question for Cecilia, is there a place to put a... An icon? I mean, I'm, I'm sure we don't want a whole lot of icons, but how does somebody get to it quickly? Uh, hi, uh, committee. Cecilia Gardo daly Community Development Director. I will um, pull that up and see how you get to it. Yeah. Um, the way we did it was social services, and it came up, and then a page comes up, and it, the first thing on the page is about a grant application, then there's some letters, and it's blue, but you don't really know it's a hyperlink. It's just blue letters, and they're not underlined. And it says, it was Community Resource Directory, and you click on it, yeah. and then it brings up these pages. Yeah. So, okay, so from, so from the home page, what you do is um, you go to um, the heading Departments and Services, and it's going to bring up um, major categories um, like city clerk, code compliance, public works. One of these uh, major categories is human resources. I'm sorry, not human. It's housing and social services. Right. You go to housing and social services. You click on, and under that heading, it's homeless resources, the emergency shelter overlay, housing services, senior services, and social services. So that's how you get to it. You click on Housing and Social Services, and it'll take you to your landing page where um, you would um, organize your social services directory that you're talking about. Okay. Um, and it's a link. So the link is always live. So one idea is to make sure that all of the organizations in town know where the link is. So if someone comes in, um, and I'm sure Mary's, on the, she'll be on the call later, comes, comes in and needs something, you just go to your computer, press the link, and it's, it's up to date. Um, but yeah. again, we need to keep it up to date. So and question about this. Is there somebody who's able to identify exactly how often that link has been uh, viewed or, show, you know, been clicked on? So we can see exactly maybe, you know, what, what traffic is going there, if any at all, and if there's some other way or path to get to, to, to get to it. It's obviously, you know, one, two, three, four, five clicks down to get to this list. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but you have to really know what you're looking for. And it might be, mm -hmm. it might serve the city to have something that, you know, if you're looking for homeless support, which is, you know, probably on everyone's mind, it might be easier to have something that closer to the landing, the city landing page. A little more user friendly. Like if somebody's searching for um, what's our mental health services or senior services like we're talking. Yeah. Right. I see what you're saying. Yeah, and, and I think the first thing would be to see is there any you know, what kind of what kind of traffic is being driven through there? What's the click through rate on the on that site? Um, can we see if anybody's even accessing it and if the answer is no, what are our opportunities to make it more visible or easier to find? 
Those are great comments. Um, I'll write. I'll write up those comments today. Um, I don't know the IT group. You probably have that. I would assume the IT group knows how many times that's been clicked. Um, but after that, I mean, you, you wouldn't know what they were looking for because it's all one big 16-page document. It does have sections in it, which is good. Um, and they're in alphabetical order. So if you're looking for housing, it's under homeless. Hospitals are under hospitals. Um, but then some of the, I'm sure that there could be certain organizations that could be in here twice. And are there are there websites linked to on the in there? There used to be, but now there are not. There, well, there are. Yes, there are. Okay. Some of them are here. Yes, like Boys and Girls Club is here. Um, so like for Boys and Girls Club, it says Boys and Girls Club of the South Coast Area, 1304 Calle Valle, San Clemente, California, 9672, 949-492-0376, www.bcbcsca.org. So that's pretty much everything. And it's under after-school resources. Yeah. Now, I don't know if Terry, I was thinking, don't, aren't there things like keywords where you could look for something two different ways? Um, I'm sort of, sort of putting Terry on the spot right now. but. If you were going to look for Boys and Girls Club, what would, you, other than after school resources, what else would someone look for? So, hi everybody. Thanks for having me. Hi. Um, I apologize. I, I'm trying to do six things at once. So, uh, you, you, I feel I, I've been popping in and out of watching the Supreme Court hearings today. So, I'm going to answer the question, but I'm going to go back a little bit first. So our operations at the moment, kids are back in school. High school kids went back to school today, um, but it's been a phased approach where the middle, the uh, elementary school kids are, are at school. Excuse me, can you, can you please introduce yourself and let us know who you're representing? Sure. Terry Hughes on the... Uh, CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of the South Coast area here in San Clemente. Kid, uh, elementary school kids are here after school five days per week. Middle school kids are here when they're not in school. They're a little bit of a hybrid model. And, and high school kids just started back in school today. They're also a hybrid model. We are serving kids probably at about 40, 50% capacity that we normally would. And um, it's just much quieter, right? We, you know, we have small groups that we don't, well, you know, we follow social distancing, they're wearing the mask and all that. So you, you've asked a question, what advertisement? It's hard for me to kind of break off and say, we're a place for kids after school to get their homework done, to get involved in art projects, uh, use it to technology centers, play sports. They have and, and build relationships yeah. with adults who care about them. But I find Boys and Girls Club under counseling. I, mean, I don't want to get into a big oh. discussion, but my question is, should we have keywords? Because everything here is only found under one place. So if you're looking for something like counseling, you might not find Boys and Girls Club, but I don't know whether, or, or tutoring. So I was yeah. wondering yeah. if we could use keywords. To, to, to homework help. Not, tutoring is a, is a bit strong. They, you know, that's one-on-one. -on -one. We have a relationship with the Prevention and Wellness Center where kids do get counseled over here. But I don't know that a, a family who's struggling is all of a sudden going to say, oh, let me bring my kid to the Boys and Girls Club so we can get counseling. I don't think, I don't think we're the first place they go for that. I think um, Paula's question would really be, if a parent is looking to find the Boys and Girls Club, what would they be typing into their Google search bar to find you? Youth activities. Okay. That's After we're... school vacation. Okay. So I'm thinking that, and th I mean, this is going to be big, but I'm just thinking that it, I don't know that much about keywords. I should, but I mean, I know how to search, but I've never made keywords. But I think, and maybe that's just too daunting, but if this is going to be something that's searchable, it would be nice to have keywords, and then things come up, and then they could be changed on the fly, but then we would have to assign someone, of course, to update this. 
Yeah. But see, that wouldn't be tied to our website, Paula. That would be tied to Boys and Girls Club. If we want keywords that bring people to the city website, it would be things like uh, community resources or uh, mental health services, and then we, that would then link to this resource booklet, at which mm -hmm. point the resource booklet would then have the website is probably the best that the best information that can be found, Boys and Girls Club, then we, they can click on that, and it'll go right to Boys and Girls Club, which actually helps both the city and the Boys and Girls Club SEO when those backlinks are, are quick. So um, we want to think about the keywords that bring people to our site, looking for those resources, and then those resources would be linked directly to the organization that we're listing, is what I think. Well, that makes sense because we're updating isn't that one of our responsibilities for this year, updating um, updating our resource directory? Right, right. So if we're updating our resource directory besides valid resources, I think accessibility or uh, finding what you're looking for via the city, that's a key part of it. Last time we went from paper to this, and this time it's upgrading the resource directory online to a more old what Brenda's pointing out, a little more user-friendly, searcher-friendly um, way to access it. I think that makes a lot of, that's a lot, makes a lot of sense, you know, it does. Yeah, just to add to that as well, um, I'd say that, you know, the way that we've structured our work plan and, uh, you know, meetings going forward with having guests that speak on a certain subject, um, which we can then, you know, potentially take more action on and have a full community forum on. I think this list is, is great to draw from when we're looking for people to come in and speak to us about a certain subject. I think as looking to be the sounding board for the community, we can, we can have that sense for what the needs are in the community so that people don't necessarily have to be out searching for it. We can bring it to them through, through these meetings and ultimately through community forums. So I was really glad that Kathy recommended that we add this to our work plan and, and that, I might recommend that we just split it up two pages, you know, per person, and we can each call through um, each of the organizations on there and make sure the info is updated and uh, and add any that we we might find. It might be kind of tough with the alphabetical order on there, but uh, I think yeah, I'll if I'll them and I'll figure it out. There's eight, there's seven of us, so I'll figure it out because some pages have a lot and some pages don't. So um, I'll figure out how to make it equal, and um, maybe we can get it done or in, in two weeks, in two months, like we did the last time. So, but this is great. And I mean, I didn't even know about all this stuff. So this is, this is wonderful. Just a question. Uh -huh. Just a question. If it's going to be uh, more user friendly, if we actually uh, recreate the document, because right now it says a document that people can like download, print the document. Would it be more user friendly if it was actually up there as a, uh, as a web page itself, in which uh, the links to the web pages to the organizations are direct links. Okay, I'm just thinking if this is a resource guide that people are accessing online, having something that I can then download, print out, is not necessarily as effective as something that I can directly click through to get to where I want to get, to get me the information that I want to get. So I don't know how feasible it is if there's somebody. Um, uh, if there's somebody in the IT department for the city who it's even possible for them to put it on their workload to not have this just as a, uh, a printable document, but actually just, you know, typed on as a web page with direct links. But I think that could make it more user friendly if it was. Um, I will, I'll email the, uh, the IT department and ask them what it would take. Um, I mean, I know if you did, if, if you, Click on the if, if they're underlined and you click on these webs on these um, URLs, it'll go well. I think it will. I'm not sure. Um, but if it's a direct link, if if it's just a part of a document, um, it, it may or may not, depending upon how the document is. Uh, you're right. You're right. To okay. Anybody <laughs> willing to talk to IT besides uh, Paula? That like uh, Burden, you you sound like you know how to talk to IT about something like this, not to throw something in your lap, but... Oh, I, I, can, I can fake my way through it, yeah. Okay. okay, good, do that. Do you mind, Dan, I'll <laughs> later? Do we, have a, do we have a contact in the ID de IT department, or uh, shall I just contact the IT department? Uh, Any, from, anyone can, from the city who's here with us? I'm sorry, this is Janet. I can provide Paula with that information, and she can turn it to you, Burton. Okay, perfect, thank you, Janet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. 
Okay, so I will assign work, and then Burton will uh, contact IT. We don't want them to spend too much time, that's for sure, but um, no. maybe a way that we can do this easily. Cool. I just said that. Uh, advantage of Burton taking it on, if you get your two pages right, you can see, then you got a working example to talk to IT about. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. As you march through the two pages, right, and you can have actual practical experience explaining what you what you want to have mm -hmm. and working for you. Cool. Does that make is that clear? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Paula, do we need to approve this work plan in our meeting? I know the council's already approved it. Um, do we have to take action on this, or is it just informational? I don't know the answer to that. Um. It's, it's informational. The council's already approved it. Okay. I just had one more comment then, just in relation to the uh, mid-year budget review. Um, we talked about bringing the council back, you know, the, sort of a, a litmus of need for the organizations that would have gotten those social service grants. So, you know, however we decide we want to survey those, um, I think it was 19 organizations, I think it'd be useful to go to them and, and ask them what impacts, you know, losing that funding has had and, and make a recommendation to council for the mid-year budget review. I agree. Okay. So go to the orgs that were defunded and find out what their needs are right now so that we're more specific. And it's, it sounded like that's what the council asked us to do anyhow, so just, just wanted to reiterate. Okay. All right. Um, and I have that PowerPoint, so, and I have the names of the people, and we, don't, we pretty much know who most of them are. And some of them are on this call, so. Okay. Um, I don't think I need to do a motion on that. Okay. Um, anything else on this? On our work plan or the resource directory? Thank you, Tyler. That was great. Um, and thank you, Burton. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, really quick on the high school award. I finally, the person that we worked with last year is on maternity leave, and I finally got, I went to the Capital Unified and I found Chris, the, Chris Carter, and I actually wrote to him, and I did write to the person that is on maternity leave. Somehow it got to the guidance department, and it got to someone named Christina Van Patten, who's going to be the person that will be, uh, I'll be working with. So, um, assuming that Toby still wants to do it, um, and I'll, I'll set up something. I don't know what we can do for kids that are seniors now, because um, we would have, what we would have done last year, they would be seniors now, but they would have already been interviewed and talked to us. So I don't know what they're going to need, but whatever they're going to need, I'll find out from the high school, whatever they need from us, and we'll go from there. Um, so I'll have more, because I just started back today. I will have more at the next meeting on that. Okay. So the topic of that I invited all these people for... <laughs> is um, the impact assessment of COVID-19. And I did, I invited um, uh, Terry from the Boys and Girls Club. I invited Luke and Mia from COA. I invited Beth Apodaca from the Senior Center from, um, well, the Wellness Org. And that's it. So I don't know, I, can, I know that Beth has a presentation. So, and how to, uh, basically, this is our, one of, on our work plan. We would like to know. Oh, and, 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 and Mary is also here. Mary will be here. And it looks like it's almost 4 o'clock. So Mary will be here. Elizabeth is on. I just see she's from FAM. So we have four organizations. And what we'd like to know, if we can, if, and I, I don't know how much time we have. We have another maybe 45 minutes. I'd like to know the impact of COVID on the community, things that we probably don't know, and what your needs are and how we can help. So we want to start, Beth was the one, the first one to submit. So Beth, do you want to, we want to bring up Beth's first? Or? Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah, you can put the PowerPoint up. I'll go through it real quickly. So we can't hear her. 
Well, uh, there we go. We're check we're okay, there's the first page one. Okay, so this is just briefly, and you can go to the next page. So you'll see here that um, some of the major impacts on the aging population, and we're seeing quite a bit of, is food insecurity and scarcity, socialization, which then turns to depression, elder abuse, and lack of technology access. Next page, please. So be because um, the older population is vulnerable to serious complication from COVID, they're fearful of going out to the markets, et cetera. We've seen that people have been, you know, trying to help them get food, food banks. But so many of them, because of all the hoarding and all the things that went on, have just a very big fear that they're not going to have enough food and they're not going to be able to find it. And it's from the beginning months of COVID. We haven't been able to get past that this time. So... A lot of people, you know, neighbors, uh, pantries, we're trying our heart, but we're all really trying to help them through this. Um, next slide, please. One of the biggest things that we're having right now is social isolation. Loneliness and social isolation frequently co-occur and are, are too common in older adults. While the term loneliness refers to subjective feeling, isolation is defined by the level and frequency of one's social interactions. And so below there are some bullet points here that kind of just give you an idea what this is causing for our seniors at home health-wise. Uh, it, it's an increase in premature death from all causes with about a 50% increased risk of dementia. Um, poor socialization are put, associated with about 29% increased risk of heart disease and 32% risk of stroke. Lonely is associated with a higher rate of depression, anxiety, and suicide. Loneliness among heart failure patients is associated with nearly a four times increased risk of death, 68% increased risk of hospitalization, and 50% risk, increased risk of emergency department visits. Next slide, please. So something that comes out of the isolation and loneliness is the depression, and this has led to a higher rate of depression, and depression can have detrimental effects on overall health, particularly for older adults. Depression can cause sleep disorder, fatigue, and other physical symptoms that can worsen the chronic conditions, including diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. Depression right now is, is so prevalent about uh, seniors that um, I don't know how our older population is going to recover from this last six, seven months, as right at this point in time, you know, we're in phase four, or I'm not sure what color it is this week. Um, but we're going to be the last people, the seniors are, to come back out. So it, there's going to be a lot of fallout from all of this. And then the next slide, please. And unfortunately, elder abuse we're seeing a lot of. Uh, the majority of the elder abuse cases, the perpetrator is the family member, most often an adult child or spouse. As older adults stay home to reduce exposure, they are not engaging with the important social systems such as medical providers, senior centers, and congregations. These entities are critical touch points for identifying elder abuse and exploitation. The COVID-19 pandemic has also created widespread economic uncertainty for millions of people who have been laid off or furloughed. As most adult older adults receive consistent monthly incomes from sources as, such as investments or social security, those who are struggling might be more inclined to financially exploit an older family, family member. There have been thousands of reports of scammers, non-existent you know, tests, all kinds of the scams that they have. But most of the elder abuse we're seeing are from the young children having to move back in with their parents and realizing that their parents' houses are paid off, they have this income stream, and et cetera. So it has been just a very tough six months here. Uh, Next slide, please. The last thing that's really been done is during that, they have, the seniors have been isolated, it's technology. And as, my, as you can see, the, the picture of the flip phone pretty much sums up a majority of our older base seniors here within the San Clemente. Uh, social distancing comes with less to less you know, interaction, which may be particularly harmful to older adults given their existing levels of loneliness. While social technologies can be used to provide critical social inter exact interaction during this time of necessary physical distancing, older adults tend to either lack access to these technologies or the skills and experience to use them. And then once they get online, older adults face the additional challenge of being out, you know, outsized targets of misinformation and scams, both with the bandwidth and the context of the COVID-19. 
we're seeing that many of our seniors don't even have a smartphone, a tablet, a computer, anything to help them try to stay engaged with all the Zoom programs we're offering and everything else. So there, there's a lot going on in our senior population. And as, as I said already, and there's many months for it to come. So that is kind of the abbreviated version. I just want to give you kind of the impacts that COVID has had on us. Here at Agewell, we are constantly engaging with them. We're doing wellness checks. We're, you know, making the phone calls to, you know, making sure they're okay. We have to social distance. So, I mean, we, when we deliver, we're delivering probably three to four times the amount of meals to seniors within our community right now. And we can engage with them, you know, outside, you know, six to seven feet apart to the best, our, you know, that we can. Um, but they're just missing, you know, interaction with their kids. A lot of these seniors don't want to spend the last year or so of their life sitting at home. They would rather just go out, and a lot of them you'll hear now are saying is they would rather catch COVID than sit at home the last year of their life. So we're dealing with lots and lots of fallout that I don't think any of us were prepared for at the beginning. So that's that's it. That's my little speech. Steph, how did your vaccination, your drive-through vaccination thing go? Actually, it went really well. So kind of interesting and, and a note out there, um, we didn't have the senior, um, the senior strength serum, but many doctors are not, not recommending that seniors get the high potency this year because they've all been so isolated. The need for that because there's so, it's it's like, like almost like ten times more potent than the regular flu shot, and so since they've been isolated and not around, there's no need to put their body through that. So it was surprising, but we probably had about seventy eight people come through. And so it went really well. We were a little afraid we might have traffic problems and everything, but it, it worked out really well. So, so Beth, what are what are your needs that we need to communicate to city council? You know, so the money that we've always gotten from the city for that has been for case management. And right now, you know, as we all said, this was probably the worst time to even cut back, you know, on case management as our cases are growing, the needs are growing. The seniors are, they're, they're more problems and more complex. And so, it, you know, right now, more than ever, we need to have case managers. And so, you know, ours has always just paid a portion of it, you know, to, for the case manager that we have here to come in like one day a week. So it would be nice to get that back. And, you know, we have a lot of issues, but that would be the biggest one right now that we need help with. Yeah, that was, the, I think it was 4000 I think it was for... Um, so yes, yeah, so it pays. It's like pays for like a day or a part of a day for someone to be in San Clemente. But we're all learning a lot of skills in the soci, you know, in the psychology world right now. A lot of these things I don't think a lot of us knew. Were, I mean, the, the specifics of all of this is just no. And we were talking about the PTSD when this is over. It's going to be twofold. It's the people that have not even left their house at all in the last seven months who will have to make that first step out the door. And at the same time, those people on March 15th hit the ground running, have never had a chance to even realize, like we've seen with all our essential workers, the risk they've been putting themselves at for the time period too. So it's going to be a very interesting time whenever we determine the end of COVID is through the pandemic. So. Wow. Okay. Thank you. I know. Sorry, I didn't mean to be. It was supposed to be cheer, but that's what it's that's just what it's all about. I mean, that's what it's it's it's, it's a tough issue. Ever since the day the governor decided that anybody over sixty could receive three free meals a day delivered to their home, without taking into consideration that we're a little nonprofit that somehow has to pay for all of that and find the volunteers to provide those meals. It's kind of been a crazy roller coaster ride here. So, But we are doing amazing, and we're keeping in touch and trying to do the best we can to keep the spirits of our seniors up. And they want to come back and play bingo, dang it, now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... Okay, so, all right, let's go on from seniors. Let's go all the way down to children. So let's, Terry, are you available? I don't want to like interrupt what, <laughs> the, the Supreme Court hearing, but it might be over by now. But go ahead, Sharon. I'm available. Okay. How's that? 
Yep. Uh, yeah, so, I, apologies. I, I heard you mention Boys and Girls Club. I went into my big uh, uh, speech there, and you guys were just trying to find out what, what was a co uh, simple word to put on. Apologize for that. That's fine. Uh, that was interesting, listening to Beth and, and see how she's uh, put together a presentation that uh, certainly sparked some ideas. Paula, thank you for reaching out to me yesterday. did not realize um, you were getting together, and, I, and I'm happy to um, relay a few thoughts. We find that um, kids and families are really resilient, right? They, they, they just have a way of figuring things out. And for the most part, kids can, can go with the flow and, and, and figure things out. But the ones who are most vulnerable that Beth spoke to, those are the ones who are really struggling, right? And, and we're noticing mental health issues with kids who were – probably um, okay in the normal circumstances, but now that they're not um, in school on a regular basis, they do not have regular routines, we're noticing, hey, how's things going? And you see a little, you see some depression, and we're finding we have to talk to them a little bit, little bit more. We're only serving, as I started to say, 40, 30, 40% of our, our capacity, and our biggest need right now is transportation. Kids are back in school, but because of social distancing on the buses, the district is not providing busing to the Boys and Girls Club after school. So we're walking to Las Palmas School, two other schools drop kids off there, and we're walking 30, 40 kids over here a day. And, and there's another couple dozen that get dropped off here. But typically we have 200, 250 kids a day that are being dropped off at the Boys and Girls Club, and they're just not coming right now. They're taking turns with their neighbors. They're, uh, they're, you got an older kid who's home watching kids. They're just kind of, you know, taping this thing together as best they can to get through it. Um, I don't think we really know yet on the what the long term effects are going to be. Right? We've gone now six, seven months of these kids not having their regular education, and I think it's going to be some time yet till we really till we begin to understand how far behind they are in school and what type of services we can offer to get them to be caught up and, and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we're really proud of is our reading program. We, we identify about 50 kids every year who are not reading at grade level and we're able to continue to do that virtually and our program for this year starts next week, a virtual reading program for young kids, uh, first, second, third, fourth graders. But beyond that, kids are still coming here doing their school, and we're here for them, but it's just a, it's a small sample to what we're normally doing. Any questions? Well, the question, the question, well, go ahead. How many, how many high schoolers are you dealing with either before this or because of coronavirus? So, so last year we had 34 kids in our what we call our college-bound program, high school kids who came over here on a regular basis where we helped them graduate and, and find their way off to college. We had 11 graduating seniors. We've seen 15 high school kids so far this school year. They are not, and we typically get a, a, an influx of a dozen new ones because our pentacles are up over the high school. We haven't gotten any new ones this, this uh, school year because they are really out of whack right now. They just started school today. And I mean, how, in person. Yeah, that's, that's sad, you know, because just the access to what you offer is incredible. How are you managing the uh, safety protocols with the kids? So we, we've retained our full-time staff throughout this. We have eight full-time staff, and we just have uh, no groups over 14. We, we take everybody's temperatures that come in. And they're they're in silos. They're operating in silos. So so um, the the groups don't miss. The groups don't miss if we have and we have a couple extra people. For example, very often I'm called. Somebody's out. Then I'm gonna uh, supervise that classroom from a distance because I can't I, I can't get too close in there because then I potentially can't go with any other group. Do We're doing the best we can. And knock on wood. We've been open since May 26, I think, of receiving kids, and we haven't had anybody get sick yet, staff or kid-wise. 
Wow. Wow. Are you offering tech support for like the online schooling type stuff, like for you know access to devices that a lot of kids might not have? So, luckily, um, we we have um, um, Chromebooks that kids can use here as well. We have plenty of computers and all that. Throughout the summer and into the beginning of the fall, any student in this district had access to a computer. If they just raised their hand, they, the district provided them with one. So yeah, that was fine. So you're talking, oh, go ahead, Tyler. Oh, you can go. You, you. I would just say transportation, I mean, if, if, if there were more buses, because they have to be socially distanced, if there were more buses or large vans, would they get there? If, would that be the problem? Or is it just, I mean, you, you only have like one or two vans. So I don't know how you could fix so that. We, that's uh, a couple issues there, Paula. We're serving about 60 kids right now. We feel our, our facility can handle about 120 with social distancing, only so many per room. So having buses would help. We're not using our van. You can't be social distance in our van if we're starting to bring kids over here. And the school district is, what, back two, three weeks now. They are taking baby steps into how many children they're putting on these buses. Everybody's kind of starting slowly, and they're watching, you know, COVID cases. They're watching what's going on in the in the country, in our in our county, and they don't want to just say, "Hey, tomorrow, okay, fifty kids are going on the bus," because then if everybody gets sick, they got to close school down again. So everybody's just taking a cautious approach, and it's just we just kind of have to see this through. I don't I don't know that the district can snap their fingers and get 10 more buses so they can get 50 more kids in the Boys and Girls Club. I don't know that that's a priority. Right now, they're just trying to get them back to school. And maybe walk. Well, they know how to walk, but they don't need to be escorted from school to you, do they? I mean, Sure they do. Sure they do. They do. So, some, so people could just walk them there, like volunteer to do that. Los Palmas is the only school that's in walking distance. Short, short Cliffs Middle School is within walking distance, and we typically get many middle schoolers who walk over here. They're not coming. They so middle schoolers are in school twice a day, and they're being homeschooled three days, or virtually three days. The days that they're not in school, they're coming here at eight o'clock in the morning, and they're and they're with us all day. But they're not coming after school this year. Normally, they'll come when the bus. When they provide a bus form, they'll come, but they don't want to walk from Short Cliffs to the Boys and Girls Club. It's just a little too far. Now, back at, back in our day, when we walked 10 miles uphill to school both, both ways, there wasn't a problem, but, you know. I mean, you were yeah. in California back then, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for being here. And uh, first off, I just wanted to say, just to talk about response to COVID-19 and, and uh innovating in that I just want to congratulate you on a really successful fundraising campaign that you had in the gala it was uh, it was really great to see that happening all online and um, but my question is about a, a comment you made earlier about um, seeing kids uh, maybe displaying signs of depression I'm just wondering have you had to, to change your process at all have you, have you had to you know uh, change the way that that your staff is interacting with kids to to draw these things out or to deal with them or, or could you speak more on that so one of the good things that's happened here is um, you know I'm a manager right I'm a director well one of the good things that's happened here is that I've been direct services I've been I've had my own group through uh, when we were just a school and that kind of you know brings us all back that we got to do some things that we hadn't done before or previously. So we have our full time staff who may be overseeing three or four college high school kids. They're in direct contact with our kids now, hundred percent. So we notice these things more. There's there's so many less incidences. There's so many more conversations with parents. Hey, we heard him say this. We heard him say that. So we're able to provide better services right now. Just because of this, it's it's um, it's one of the benefits that's happened. We're serving less kids. The, the uh, staff to the child ratio is much less, and uh, we have a great relationship. I started to say before with uh, Susan Parmley in the wellness uh, center. 
a wellness and prevention center. They have an intern with us a couple days a week. So when we start to hear a, a little ch- a child who needs a little bit more, boom, they're in that office on the day that they're here. Or uh, w- we had a situation, um, I'm trying to think, uh, the specific incident escapes me right now. It was... Um, it was like a loss where where somebody was um, died or killed, and and uh, and I and I can't believe it. I'm just teasing you a little bit with it. And I called it Wellness Prevention Center. They were here within hours to be able to talk through uh, the situation with this child, and uh, that was just great for us to be able to do that. Thank you. I'm just curious, um, the because normally you guys receive the the grant from the city. Uh, I believe, yeah. So how is the loss of that money really impacting you guys this year? Are you telling me we're not getting the money? Um, We've been able to continue to do our programming. It was just for less children. Um, Actually, our our, uh, STEAM program, our brain game program that we did through the summer was phenomenal that uh, Veronica Vega runs, who's been here with us 25 years, the, the science projects. That, but it, it, instead of doing it for 100 kids, 200 kids, it was being done for 30 and 40 kids. That's just That was really the only uh, change there. I can tell you how you might have been impacted. Because I was supposed to get a grant, and I was going to use that, or my organization, I fact, to bring a leader, team leadership skills to the Boys and Girls Club and Wellness and Prevention. And it was meant to help augment your um, transition to, to college or, you know, post high school experience. So hopefully we'll get a chance to show that we can pull this off and cl- collaborate amongst all of our San Clemente based nonprofits in a way that will be, you know, a win for everybody. Hopefully, and, and I know others have to speak, and I'll just take another quick 30 seconds. And Tyler pointed on this. We were lucky. We closed on that Friday on, on March 13th, and by that Monday, we were delivering meals. And over 10 weeks, we delivered 7,000 meals to our most vulnerable people. And a lot of good folks in the community helped us deliver those meals. Then we opened up our summer camp early and ran a, a 13-week summer program. And then we were virtual school while kids' the, uh, school opening was delayed. We were able to market that success to our donors. And... Um, we have not taken a hit fundraising wise because of it. Now we've lost a lot of revenue in in uh, fees for service, um, summer camp fees, sport, sports fees, but um, for the most part we've held our own and we haven't employed as many part time people. So, knock on wood a little bit, we're holding our own. More, I'm more worried long term. You know, how, how's this going to go six months from now, next year, and, and throughout next year? Um, a little bit of donor fatigue with COVID nineteen and whatnot. So. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you. We're going to go now to teens and young adults. We have Koa here, Mia and Luke from Koa. I'm not sure which one of you. It looks like Luke's going to be doing the presenting. Howdy, everybody. Uh, just uh, is it cool if I share my screen for a second? Oh, that is yeah. not allowed. It says at the moment. Um, who's the host of the meeting? Just out of curiosity, that would be. Uh, All right, no, we we tried to make a PowerPoint, but it uh, didn't come through by the deadline. Uh, so I apologize for that. Um, but I will need the host to allow screen sharing for participants, so I can show you all these cool stuff we've been doing. Or if that's not the case, I can just roll right into it, and you guys can imagine in your mind. Oh, yeah, Janet maybe could do that. Um, no, that would be IT. I don't know if that's uh, available. Is Brian? Are you on? Are you on here? Not seeing a Brian. Okay, well, I mean, it is what it is. Um, we'll just have to use our imaginations. I apologize for that, though, guys. Um, so, when the pandemic first hit, we, um, me and I, and the Koa Club, came up with this uh, entity called Project Pandemic Override. And basically, we went to all the students and said, "What is your talent? What can you offer to the, your fellow peers?" And um, they came up with like so many things, like uh, poetry guitar class, uh, cooking and baking were really uh, hot ones that we were doing. We had improv chess, like the whole lot of it. We filled every day of the week um, for a good portion of the time we did it. And um, yeah, no, so it was all um, student run. 
and uh, it was really, honestly, a great success. We had um, we partnered with the Wellness and Prevention Center and um, NCAD Waymakers. Actually, uh, so Waymakers, I feel like I might have jumped the gun. The whole thing was a uh, <laughs> Zoom. It was all on Zoom, and it was like uh, all the students teaching uh, their skill to uh, fellow students. Um, I missed that little tidbit. It's important. Um, so in between classes, we would have prevention pieces to um, just like do like check-ins, like mental health, like because it was a scary time for all of us right at the start of it all, still is now. Um, and then more like drugs and alcohol awareness, all provided through, um, like I said, uh, wellness and prevention and NCAD. And they did little 30 minute uh, pieces in the beginning. Um, we also had Waymakers uh, help us um, give community service hours to all of our uh, teachers. Um, and some of them racked up by the end of it like 114 hours, which was pretty wild and awesome for them. Um, yeah, it was honestly a great success. We ended up doing a summer kickoff at the end of it uh, with Adam Grabowski. We had giveaways, guests, the whole thing. And honestly, like throughout the whole thing, it was a really great time and the students did like it, but there was a lot of Zoom fatigue. Like um, we're really kind of hitting this wall where it's like they're at school all day online and I know they just went back, but it's still chaotic like you guys were saying. And so um, we have been pushing to do a lot more, like, not a lot, but just as many in-person activities as we can. Um, and so Mia, our um, COA club president, can kind of get into some of the stuff we've been able to pull off um, in person. So Mia, do you want to take it away? I don't know if she's Yeah, there. for sure. Um, so cool. I'm Mia Arnwine, and I'm president of the COA club. We have board members, uh, we have the vice president, Nicole, and we also have a, um, a person that's a photographer, her name is Rosa. We have other things like people that make graphics for any of our, our events that we do. And some, some of the things that we've been doing is we've actually been doing beach cleanups every single other week for to provide for avid kids as well as we just to give volunteer services. We've had a lot of success with that, but I think our biggest thing that we're trying to do is kind of get people out of their comfort zone and the sense of kind of get more people able to do the things that they love, get people out of this type of mentality of being in the setting of online because it's been such a struggle as everyone stated mentally. And, you know, it's been causing a lot of like depression. And so why we're trying to get people out of this, I guess, type of environment is to be able to not get back to the way things used to be, but to do things safely and make them still happy mentally. And so the things that we're trying to do are like being successful is we have a very big um, music program that has been a very big kickoff. And so we've done lives um, to just pre just to present people's talents and you know do something that they love. But in person things, other things that we're trying to do is just prevent any depression or mental illnesses. So we're trying to figure out ways to do that successfully and safely, but doing that in person. So that is like our biggest goal, as well as trying to access the ability of, you know, providing the sense of not, you know, the awareness of drug and alcohol prevention. So that's our biggest goals. Yeah, so like a few of the other things we, we had been able to do is uh, during the summer we did co-op fishing and we had like 15 poles lined up uh, down the line, like six feet apart. Um, all the families came out, stayed in their respective boxes and the dads were loving it, it was great. Um, we are still currently doing uh, co cycling um, which has been a pretty big hit. Um, and I know it's like coming up on the cooler months, so like that's why the beach is like kind of getting like a little spotty. That was our saving grace for quite some time. Um, but what we're really looking into is like um, kind of so like not getting the grant was uh, a pretty big hit on Koa. We actually had to lay off all of our staff, which was uh, unfortunate. But it's we're still running on volunteerism, which is really awesome to see. Um, and so if we could get any like levity on uh, possibly like permits uh, for maybe doing something socially distanced at the skate park or something or um, just like any facilities that you think might like facilitate I, but I'm sure like something that might work like in your guys's mind uh, if you know of any spots of where we could do something socially distanced um, and keep within the guidelines that would be really um, appreciated on our end uh, if we could get some breaks on those permits but, yeah and I mean, that's kind of that's our presentation that's like what we've been up to so Hope you enjoyed. Any questions? How big of a group what would you need to gather? Say you go to some place like uh, the Pier Bowl. How many kids are you talking about in that? 
Uh, well, what's really cool is uh, we have this uh, operation called Sign Up Genius, and so we can put uh, whatever limit you guys would feel comfortable on um, our signups. So, like, we would have them register a spot in advance uh, to attend our events. Uh, we tried doing that with uh, our movie night. We were going to do, like, a drive-in seniors movie night, um, but our uh, spot fell through with the Baha'i Center. They just weren't comfortable at the time in the thick of things. Um, but... Yeah, no, so whatever, depending on the location, however you guys feel comfortable um, allowing the participants being there, we can work around that with you. So there's like those drive-in movies, I think, at the mall, but um, and it depends on what the activity is. I mean, they do tennis, they do golfing, they do cycling, but they also sing, and, you know, it's really hard. I mean, if you sing, you move further away from other people, but they do an awful lot with violins and with, piano and, and guitar, so there's, but they were doing that on live, but right. still needs to get people together where you can actually sing with each other six feet apart, so, yeah, and then all the craft stuff that we were doing, there's none of that anymore, because you have need too many people, so when, when things get a little bit better, they'll be able to do more crafts, because right now, you, you can't even get, like, two kids at a table, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, it, it's pretty rough right now, but it's nice to see that people are going going back to school, so hopefully that will, like, let the kids feel more comfortable um, staying safe and going out um, in the proper manners, um, you know, just, like, for our in-person activities as well. Um, but, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, Brenda? Are you doing any kind of a virtual... Uh, you, you talked about Zoom, to Zoom fatigue, which we know is real. Are there any other things that you're doing via Zoom or... Um, you know, virtual connections or things that are working? Yeah, absolutely. So, like, uh, Mia and Paula were talking about, we've been doing uh, Instagram Lives, uh, which have been actually a pretty big hit for um, our youth um, musicians. And um, it's getting them a voice and getting them, like, more notoriety and heard um, in a fun way. I was actually the uh, Instagram Live host for quite some time, and so, like, I kept it, like, fun, you know, because it's, like, on even on live or Instagram, it can be a little, like, dry just because all the energy has to come from, like, one person. There's not the audience there. Um, so I was there to keep the ball moving and uh, everyone entertained. And honestly, the entertainers, like, the musicians themselves were phenomenal, too. Um, and we're still doing those biweekly, um, just, like, whenever we can find a host at this point um, is how we're running that. Uh, and also more musicians. If you know any, uh, send them to koa.entertainment. <laughs> Hey, uh, Luke, have you have you used park space around town at all for um, outdoor activities? Um, not as of lately, um, no. So, like like I said, the uh, main thing we were trying to do was, like, um, a movie night um, of, of some kind, you know what I mean, either pillows and blankets with cones or drive-in, like I said. Um, just because, like, the one at the outlet is still 35 bucks, and a lot of the kids don't drive, um, which is kind of a kicker. That's why I was thinking of making a senior thing. But uh, long story short, we haven't um, delved into anything. But that's mainly, I think, been for permit issues and other uh, yeah. such reasons. That's, um, I'd be happy to, to help you look into that. I know that um, Samantha Wiley with the Beaches Parks and Recreation Department uh, mentioned at the last council meeting that they're, they're looking to be more friendly to organizations that are looking to have activities at parks. And uh, I know that, you know, the uh, yoga studios have had, you know, yoga at the parks through a partnership with BPR. Um, but it may be that um, you know they they might be willing to be flexible with you as a as a, a youth group. Um, so um, I'll try to see if I can get in contact with you and connect you with Samantha and see if there's any synergy there. Absolutely, please do. Do you mind if I put my email in the chat box real quick? Um, I don't see a chat box here, but um, oh. I will. Uh, I'll, I'll give it to Tyler. I have your email. Great. Thank Thanks. you, Paula. <laughs> um, Mary, sorry to make you wait the longest, but um, thank you. Thank the, you. Um, we want to know what's going on at FAM. <laughs> I'm sure you're overwhelmed, but... Okay, so thank you for the invite, Tyler. Um, at first, thank you for doing this. It was really good to hear um, from the other organizations and what they're experiencing and gave me some ideas of maybe some ways that we can do some partnering uh, with each other. So thank you for this. Um, so, as some of you know, FAM experienced a huge hit when COVID uh, happened. It happened so fast, and it was going to be, you know, a three-week thing, and we ended up um, having a 110% increase in the numbers of people calling and, and needing help. 
At the same time, 90% of our 361 weekly volunteers had to stop helping. They, they had to stay home. So um, it, was, it was interesting to navigate and about 45% decrease in food because as you recall, the stores were being hit hard and so the food we received from the stores wasn't happening. So um, we got creative quickly as everybody else here did um, and um, our thrift store had to close so our two part-time employees there came over to answer phones at FAM because the phones were ringing like crazy. We changed our food delivery to a drive through so that people could stay safe. Um, and so we had lineups of cars there and we had to find food. So our amazing uh, warehouse manager found a connection with uh, farms through Second Harvest and we started receiving three semis a week of food uh, delivered to FAM. It's now down to two semis a week. Um, and we're gonna be losing that food shortly, but we were able to make a deal with Amazon Fresh so that food just started, we just started picking up that food. So that will help us keep our supp supplies of food up. So what do we see with food? We went from, let's say, August to August comparison. It was 287,000 August of last year to 431,000 pounds of food August of this year. So huge numbers. Um, our shelters, which used to be you left the shelter every morning at 9 a.m. and you came back between three and five to do schoolwork and dinner, et cetera, with your kids. Our shelters went to 24 seven. People were being laid off from work and the kids had to stay home from school. So we quickly adapted to figure out, well, how do we help them stay safe in this environment when they're sharing rooms, et cetera, and apartment buildings, so both shelters. So we brought in an organization, uh, Families Together, who did um, taught everybody uh, best practices, as well as we've brought them in, uh, I want to say five different times now to do COVID testing at the shelters, but also here at FAM for anybody. And I noticed we had some business neighbors that got in line last time they were here um, to get their COVID testing. Um, and so we continue to offer that. They come, I think, once a month here. Um, so at the shelters, um, we started noticing uh, deterioration in relationships because people were uh, stuck there with their kids um, and so we started doing some mental health counseling as well bringing in people to help with that our other biggest changes um, stem from case management so it more than doubled the number of hours of case management required for people so people were staying as clients longer um, and they were needing to talk more so the number of hours per person doubled um, and of course we're up for that because we knew that's what they needed. Um, call after call from people saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got enough food for two weeks. Don't know what I'm going to do after that. It's like, you know what? You've called two weeks early. This is fantastic. We can get you uh, set up. We get you ready. You come in here next week and we'll figure that. And come in here no longer means come in here. So case management had to start uh, being done by um, phone. So virtual case management, that changes everything, right? You Sitting face to face with somebody and uh, growing in that relationship, making them feel comfortable to tell you their story. So a bit of a challenge uh, with the virtual case management, but the case managers are doing a great job. And we immediately had to hire a temporary case manager to help with the load. Um, so besides the two volunteers or two staff members from the thrift store, we brought over um, a volunteer or a a new staff member temporarily for case management and a warehouse um, staff person had to come in full time in order to help support the load that was going on. <clears throat> um, we have since now just recently added two drivers because our volunteer uh, volunteers are down, right? When uh, we hit the 90% of volunteers uh, having to stop, we started reaching out everywhere we could. And when we found there were families in the community whose Parents were home from work and the kids were home from school and they started coming in in family units. So we had pods that were social distancing, one family social distancing from the other family. It was amazing to see and really wonderful support in our community where people did that. We also were able to lease a building well, 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 well below market next door to us uh, that's empty. And um, so we need that in order to do social distancing. We have the Marines that come um, every few weeks or so to help us sort food. And so this having that space helped us social distance. We still find challenges with clients, um, especially our seniors. We started a senior hotline 
and we're able to, I think Beth uh, confirmed for me, um, we were able to provide some food to our San Clemente seniors. That program had stopped completely. So we used to deliver to the senior center and when COVID hit, we had to completely stop that. But then Beth, being the smart gal that she is, contacted us and we were able to, she came and just quietly picked up some extra, I think it was fresh fruits and vegetables to supplement the uh, frozen meals that they were getting so that we could make sure we had some good nutrition there. Uh, looking to see what else. The number of people receiving case management tripled. So the hours doubled, but the number of people tripled. So a huge, a huge impact. And again, couldn't do it without this amazing community of people. So how else is it affecting us? Immediately, couldn't do our gala, obviously. We had a golf tournament a, a donor organization was going to do. That didn't happen. Uh, two grantors stopped their funding. That took a hit of uh, over 500000 um, people in the community, and I think Terry mentioned uh, donors giving. We don't know if they're giving early or not. We've got about three hundred, over three hundred thousand in giving right away, um, with people feeling the heartbreak of COVID and how it was affecting people. Um, we're just not sure. So I attended a webinar the other day with some funders, and they, some of them were saying, "Yeah, we're probably not going to be giving at the end of the year." So we'll see. Um, we're, you know as everybody here is working in every way we can to make sure that we're funded. We have received um, CV funding. So there's a chunk of that from uh, HUD that came through the city um, and that's gonna help people. So to all my partners out there, if you're hearing anybody who is facing, a, they're not gonna be facing eviction right now because there's an eviction moratorium on. But if they're hurting and need help with their utilities uh, or they're wanting to get a plan together so that when they're supposed to start paying rent again, that they've got a plan in place, we can help them with that. We're, we're helping people create worksheets and work plans and figuring out how to make sure that uh, once it does hit, they're not then evicted and on the streets. So any, any kind of work that we can do for people. Um, so that's that's basically our story. Um, we just we just keep moving forward and want to continue to support as many people as possible. Where, where do you get, if you run out of food, where does the food come from? Because the <laughs> restaurants aren't cooking as much, so you're not getting leftovers as much from them. So where do you get the food? So we typically don't get restaurant food because we don't have a commercial kitchen unless they're bringing us something that was prepared and still sealed. So we were picking up 611 fresh rescues a week, mostly from grocery stores. So that slowed way down. So we've got two, like I mentioned before, two semis of fresh farm food that is coming to us. It's really good uh, quality. Delighted to be able to have that. That is going away in November. So in the meantime, we found a connection and we are going to start, we just started Amazon Fresh. So their leftover food every day, we're going three times a week now to pick that up. But we had to rent a truck to do it because it's way bigger than what our typical uh, load of pickups are from local grocery stores. So we're leasing a truck right now and we found uh, someone to finance that first year of that truck for us. Um, and so that helped tremendously. Uh, hello? Hi, Bill. Hello. Yeah. Mary, thank you so much for all of your energy and creativity in the middle of all this monkey business. What, what are you seeing in terms of uh, homeless numbers of people? Yeah, so interesting. The county stepped up and realized that um, they needed to provide something across the county uh, right. to make sure that the people on the streets uh, who are vulnerable we're getting some some sort of assistance and protection in, in off the street. So they opened up Joplin, which was the old uh, detention center, um, and they opened up a hotel. I'm sure you, most of you heard about that in Laguna Hills or Laguna Woods, somewhere over there. Um, to, one was for people who were COVID positive, and one was for people who were just at risk. Uh -huh. but, uh, but another program that um, was more locally here was is Project Room Key. It's still going right now. It was supposed to end, but it's still going on. So we're case managing 11 people who were formerly on the streets um, at, with their in a hotel room. Um, and some of them are on our streets right here. Uh, they're in hotel rooms, and we're case managing them and tr and trying to make sure that they have a connection to something more permanent before their 30 days runs out. Two of them have had their 30 days extended because they're such extreme cases. So, How many case managers do you have now total? 
uh, let's see. I want to say a five for that side of the house, so seven altogether, plus we have three volunteers that pick up phone calls five days a week for us. All of our calls are now going to a hotline, and so they're going through and, and doing the, the pre-work to it because someone may be calling from Anaheim for food. We don't want them to come all the way down here. We want them to be connected with an agency up in Anaheim. So the volunteers are vetting the initial calls, and then they're sent out to each of the case managers. Hey, Mary, it's Brenda. Hi. Nice, nice to see you again. I can't see you, but I get to hear your voice at least. <laughs> Um, yeah, so based on the things we so there is currently an uh, eviction moratorium that's not going to last forever. Right. Have you and other organizations that that create that provide the services that you do have any kind of projection or understanding of what homelessness is going to look like when the moratorium is over? Boy, what we're trying to do is uh, is avoid that. What we're trying to do is is get as many people connected now as possible to figure out what their go forward plan is. So some people have returned to work. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, they're still going to have some catch up time, and we're helping them with worksheets. Sometimes their landlord has already prepared a worksheet with them and said, if you start paying me this amount, like your regular rent plus this amount, you'll be caught up by a certain time. So we're seeing some of that going on, which is you know great for the landlords to be cooperating like that. Um, so a projection, no, we're hoping to, to stave that off any way we can. And so then you brought up another good, interesting strategy is are you or anybody in this, the structure there coordinating with landlords, seeing if they would, what they're willing to do to keep this, uh, keep their buildings from being emptied. Uh, to have people turned out on the streets. I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great question. It's something we've been doing all along. So we've always been uh, talking to the landlords. Um, when there's somebody that rents from them that's facing eviction, we'll have that conversation with them. Hey, what about, and we'll actually try to teach the client to have the negotiating conversation with them, but we're right there with them. So as far as actively reaching out to landlords, we'll do it as people are coming in. Um, some of our landlords have known us for a long time. Sometimes when they have somebody leave, they'll call us, you know, and let us know there's some, they have an empty place in case we have a client that needs a place. So we've got some active uh, relationships already going. Last question. Do you have, is there any leads on permanent supportive housing that will be coming? There might be. There might be more permanent supportive housing coming countywide. Um, some funding. I know we're, uh, we just applied for some more prevention funds from the county, um, as well as, um, uh, it, it's not PSH, but it's RRH. So rapid rehousing rather than PSH. And rapid rehousing for higher acuity personnel than you usually would have. So they might, they might just be under that PSH acuity level, but they're above the regular rapid rehousing. It's kind of the gap of homeless that don't fit into any program. Um, so we've just applied for that kind of funding and we brought in some other agencies to make it a collaboration. Uh, so a whole group to offer um, assistance in a kind of a full service. It includes that families together for medical, COVID testing, United Way for um, a couple of their funding programs, um, and then uh, another agency. Good news, good news. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to say thank you, Mary, so much for being here on short notice. Uh, appreciated it. Great presentation. It's, it's it was great to see you today. Nice to see you too. Thanks for coming and touring, Tyler. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you all the speakers. Yeah, thank Mary. you so much. This was really educational. This was the goal. I'm glad. Um. Okay. Moving on, <laughs> we have four minutes. And um, the next is going to be the homeless subcommittee with Tyler and Bill. Uh, Tyler, you want me to why don't I get started and you can kind of fill in with the facts. Is that Sounds good. Sounds so, great. Um, we're part of this uh, joint homeless subcommittee now. That's what they're calling us. The JHSC, Joint Homeless Subcommittee. There's four of us on the committee, two from... I'm sorry, Bill, can you get a little closer to your uh, microphone? I'm having a hard time hearing what you're saying. You're coming in and out. Okay. Yeah, I'm saying we have four people on this joint homeless uh, subcommittee. Um, it's now... We've all been sworn in, and um, there's two of us, two from our committee, as you know, and then two people from the safety 
um, a committee who are just really great to work with. So we're all getting along very fine. Um, we finally had another, our second meeting. And um, I don't know if you know these people. Gary, um, is it Welsh? Walsh, are you with me, Tyler? Walsh, yes. Gary Walsh um, uh, is one of them, and the other guy's name is... Rick Leffler. Rick Leffler. I think Rick's been pretty active in town here. Uh, so the, the four of us have met uh, twice now, and um, uh, the last meeting we put together and finalized a plan... So the the um, city council requested a uh, a plan like we did here for for uh, human affairs committee, and so we put together the plan. All four of us contributed a part of that, and then the uh, staff kind of melded the thing together. Did a great job of of putting a final a plan together, um, and. And so that was approved at our last meeting, and that's about as far as we've gotten. We're we're still going along with the idea of uh, of doing seminars and our town hall meetings, and but we're starting out with kind of the idea of let's get let's get the data together about what we know and don't know, and, um, and so far I think it's going to be a real challenge for us to keep to keep um, the community. Um, and all of its major divisions and subdivisions and interests and churches and everything else uh, kind of coordinated in terms of a collaborative effort. And and so that's hard to do. We've only got four people on the committee and under the Brown Act really is hard to it's hard to mobilize anything at all. And the minute more than two of us want to meet together, we're, we're in some kind of violation and uh, They've locked um, they've locked Tyler up a few times, but we got him back out, so he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we got to keep him running for office here. But uh, Tyler, would you have anything to add to that? I think this is going to be a good group if we can get moving here. Yeah, no, it's a great um, report, and and uh, I think the the committee's headed in in a good direction right now. Um, in in drafting that work plan and, and submitting to the city council and um, we'll, we'll hope that they'll approve the, the work plan um, and uh, essentially you know I think there's seven different parts uh, that was sent out to the to the committee so you, you should all have a copy um, one of the one of those um, work plan project items is uh, community forums so similar to the human affairs committee I think that subcommittee wants to host um, some sort of a workshop or forum format um, community engagement opportunity to discuss um, uh, subjects that, that we have researched and, and get community feedback on on those things and maybe what the community's priorities are in terms of uh, you know how we should address homelessness and and uh, what our focus should be in, in forming an overall strategy and ultimately the goal of this subcommittee is is as one of our work plan items or work plan projects points out is, is creating an overall strategy that we'll recommend to the council and uh, it's been said that, that, you know, in the past that we'd want to do something similar to what Dana Point did with their um, community work plan on homelessness. And, um, and, and certainly, I think actually I was talking to Mary earlier today, and, and she was a part of that task force for Dana Point that, that put together that work plan. And we're, you know, several years later in, in putting together ours, so the format will be different, the content will be somewhat different. Um, but generally, it's all about just getting our stakeholders together understanding you know what they're actively doing now and what the effectiveness is where we where there are gaps that we could fill in and maybe looking at also looking at what other cities are doing um, with their homeless populations be it in their homeless outreach services or um, with with housing and uh, so yes a lot of information gathering um, community engagement and and then ultimately compiling that to uh, to make a recommendation to the council uh, over the next year so looking forward to Seeing the council's determination on that work plan, and and uh, as Bill mentioned, it's going to be tough working with two people at a time outside of meetings. But you know, we'll do the best we can, and um, and we'll, we'll report back to our committee here. Thank you. I have a hard question for you. Um, are any surprises? And you don't have to answer. I, I I wouldn't even know what to say. But 
anything that you are learning that you didn't already know that just really, like I said, surprised you or floored you about anything? I could say, you know, um, it, what, what we've done so far is, is very surface level. It's very generalized, and it's, it's putting, putting together an overall strategy for the work that we'll do in, you know, moving forward into the future. Um, so I, I can't say that there's anything specifically I'm, I'm surprised at. You know, I, I think we're, we're trying to stay high level bird's eye right now and then get the approval of the council and then once we, you know, once we get that, then we can we can dive in and, and, and get to work. So I'll, I can answer that question as we as we move forward. Yeah, I think I think from my my point of view, there's not too many givens um, yet. In other words, we don't know if we're dealing with just the San Clemente alone um, kind of program, or whether we're talking about a regional activity. Uh, the council really hasn't given us a whole lot of direction yet. I think they're waiting. To get some recommendations from us, and then they'll make up their minds. But um, that's very slow in coming, and uh, so we don't know about shelters yet, or um, you know, the long-term, short-term, and long-term strategies that are out there. So we don't have a whole lot of answers yet from the council in terms of direction. But we're anxious to get have that first meeting with them, so we can get more direction, so we don't go off uh, in strange directions. Well, there'll be a point in time, you know, years past, so there was a point in time survey. Like, I believe it was last January, wasn't it? Uh, a point in time yes. survey. Yes. Yeah. And um, that will continue to happen. Yeah. And we'll be a part of that. And so, you know, the, the, the city's numbers as it, as it pertains to homeless individuals in our town is all based on that last point in time count, and it'll be updated the next time we do it. Um, I think it's next year. Well, like January, February, right? It's every two years. The point in time count by the county is done every two years. Every two years. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So the only other thing is, the, and I'm not, I mean, I have substantive views for our next education topic. I think we'll add, we could add more to that. Um, I would like to bring. I will, I'll contact Ann Christensen and see if she wants to meet with a few of us um, before September, December, whether she wants to present something. I think this COVID-19 thing, I learned a lot today, and I, 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 I wanted to know what was really going on. So this, this whole thing seems very fluid with what's going on in the world right now. So I think we'll, um, our education topic for December will sort of make itself apparent in the next four weeks, I would think. Um, but I think that we haven't addressed substance abuse, which is why it's on here. We addressed other issues that we did specifically, because that also crosses from children all the way to criminals. And, it's a t um, and there's a lot of different ways of handling it. So um, I will reach out to Anne and see if who she wants to meet with. And um, if you have any ideas about uh, people to present, or we can get updates from, I thought Beth's was great too. I would like to get an update from Beth on if anything has changed um, and how we can help. The, the one thing I wanted to say is I've spent a lot of time talking to Kathy over the past couple of weeks and she wanted to make it clear to, to me because I kept thinking I was supposed to figure out what the city needed. And she thinks, no, we should reach out and find out what the city needs. We shouldn't make assumptions. We should be reaching out. We should be going out, going to all these forums like we used to before COVID, Cinco de Mayo, and all of the things that appear. It's not so easy for us to do that now because of the social distancing. And, but the more info, like we're just going to be, we should be a sponge. We should be finding out what the needs are and then raising those as we see it as, as, as they're needed to city council, either through the oral communications at the meetings, sending them email. I mean, they, they do read the email that we send them. So, um, but again, I was trying to figure it out myself. And I think that it should just come to us and then we can just find out where the resources are, what the needs are and move from there. What is our next meeting date? Uh uh, it is December 8th. Okay. And I think that is it. 
Um, I'll be reaching out to you with all the action items that I wrote down on here. <laughs> so with that, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Motion to adjourn to our next regular scheduled meeting on December 8th at 3.30 p.m. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All righty. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Thanks, Cecilia. Thanks, Mary. You're still sticking okay. the Okay. Thank all you. Right. Thanks. Bye.